My name is Kelsey Lachlan, and um, like Jackie said, I'm actually feeling a bit of an imposter here at Apna because I work in acute care. So I do have a background in pediatric emergency, um, but I have to say that my heart and head are really in primary care. Um, I really do have a strong set of values in prevention, promoting health in a community, and although I, I love emergency, having these beliefs that primary care is important has led me to study a master's in public health, which I've just finished. Um, and uh, luckily there was a practicum component. So since September, I've been working at a primary care center um, in Inala, which is a neighborhood just south of Brisbane. So it was a unique practicum placement for me as a student. Uh, it was my first time working at a primary care center. So I'm just gonna give a bit of an acknowledgement to them and, and what Inala does and then I'll get into what I'm going to talk about today with the uh, adverse childhood experiences. So I had to put up my maple leaf because I am Canadian and I studied my master's through my university back home in Canada um, through distance education and all the primary care, um, like I said, is in a neighborhood just south of Brisbane. Um, and it's a not-for-profit primary care clinic and Inala is actually Queensland's most disadvantaged suburb. Um, just some numbers there to kind of outline what kind of uh, neighborhood it is, 67% are healthcare card holders, 4% uh, that is, they are in the lowest 4% of socioeconomic postcodes in Australia. Um, in all of primary care has served patients from 119 ethnicities, that's part because they're part of the uh, refugee health network in Queensland, which is fascinating. Um, uh, 1,000 is the number of consultations they're seeing per week. Um, 40,000 people were seen last year. And from someone like myself who's only really worked at big tertiary care facilities, this is an amazing place for me to see primary care in action. And what I really did see was a small but dedicated group of, of nurses, doctors, and allied health who not only were providing really good clinical care, but they're advocates for marginalized populations and they're active in academic research. So they're in, they've got stakeholders and people interested in some of their research they're doing with University of Queensland, Australia Catholic University, Jackie. Um, and I have found in my studies and, and the way that primary care can work the best for the community is really these three things that I've underlined, critical care, advocacy, and research. And it has been an amazing placement for me as a student, so I feel really lucky that they took me on. Um, so ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. Now, the project we're working on in Inala is still in the planning stages. So what I'm gonna talk a lot about today is just what ACEs are, um, why they are important, and what toxic stress does to the body, because I really do think this is important for us to understand as nurses. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about how ACEs can play a role in primary care. So there's health risk behaviors, and I think as a nurses, there's an instinctual understanding we have that if you've had a really rough upbringing or have had adversity in childhood, you may be more likely to smoke or drink or try drugs. So that's not news, we understand that, but ACEs goes beyond that. But health risk behaviors is a big part of ACEs that we need to keep in mind. Life potential. So if you talk to anyone that's in education, criminal justice, or social work, the idea of adversity in childhood affecting us later in life, I mean, that's just a main theme in those realms. That's not news either, but it is still a part that we need to consider that's a big part of what adversity in childhood can affect. But what I'm going to talk about, and what the, a lot of the project we did in Inala was really just research on how ACEs impacts our health. It affects our health and our well-being beyond just decisions that we've made or behaviors that put our health at risk. So ACEs, just a bit of a background of ACEs has come from a study called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. There's a big study that came out in 1998, so it's 20 years old already, um, with the Center for Disease Control and Kaiser Permanente. Um, and doctors Vincent Felitti and Robert Anda teamed up to create a massive study. Dr. Vincent Felitti actually, it's the whole story started, that he was running an obesity clinic. And he, some of his patients had revealed a history of childhood abuse. And so he added that question to some of his history intakes and became much more than just a coincidence that he had patients in his clinic that were had histories of childhood abuse. And as we know in, in healthcare, nothing really will make change without some scientific evidence. So he teamed up with an epidemiologist from the Center for Disease Control and they sent out enormous um, numbers of surveys and got over 17,000 participants for this really <coughs> landmark study and what it is, it's, so the ACEs is a 10-point questionnaire, basically, and it's 10 types of adversity. And it's 
a survey for adults to fill out. If you answer yes to one of them, you get a score of one, and you end up with an ACE score of zero to 10, somewhere in there. And so it asks about abuse, neglect, where your parents divorce, your parents incarcerated, mentally ill, struggle with substance abuse, things like that. So that's what the 10 questions are. And what they found was a dose-response relationship between ACE scores and long-term health outcomes. And it is a very clear dose-response relationship. So at the bottom there, it says number of ACEs. That's your ACE score going up. And then on the y-axis is risk for negative health and well-being outcomes. There's still a lot of research going on on this today. And so far, they've found over 40 negative health outcomes that are significantly connect, correlated to your ACE score. So the reality of ACEs, they're common. Two-thirds of people have at least one, and most people are convinced it's actually higher than that. One-eighth of people, so one in eight, have four or more ACEs. And if you have four or more, these are some of the health issues that have been connected to it. In red, those are the odds ratios. So last year in the Lancet, the Lancet Public Health, they did a large meta-analysis, a big systematic review of all the ACEs literature they could put together and health outcomes to connect them to odds ratios. So how much more likely someone may be to have some health outcomes based on having four or more ACEs, ACE score, four or more of an ACE score. So on the left, I put mental health and social challenges. These are numerous. Like I said before, with life choices and, and social challenges, these are numerous. And on the right, a bit more health outcomes. But like I said, there's over 40 that they found. These are just some of them. But they're significant. I mean, respiratory disease three times, cancer 2.3. This is all how many more times likely. It's, it's phenomenal. And on average, a 20-year life expectancy reduction. 20 years. So it all comes down to stress. So I'm just going to give a quick overview of stress and toxic stress, because that's really with deep down what is causing ACEs. And a lot of this is what we brought forward to the staff at Inala Primary Care, because the whole idea was to get buy-in from the doctors and the nurses why are we doing this? Why is it important for us? So just a quick background on, I really like this infographic on types of stress. There's really good positive stress that's difficult, but it's, a, it's important for us to grow. There's tolerable stress, which is very difficult, but it's a one-off event, um, maybe a death in the family. And there's toxic stress, which if you see those boulders, that's abuse, neglect, a parent with an addiction, and can be insurmountable. So toxic stress in the brain. So stock, I'll just talk a bit about how toxic stress can affect our health. In the most basic sense, it actually changes growth in our brain. So the amygdala, which is part of our limbic system, right, and, and also known as the reptilian brain, is actually enlarged. They'll do brain scans on people that have had childhood trauma, toxic stress, and it's enlarged. And an enlarged amygdala causes increased impulsivity. The prefrontal cortex is underdeveloped. So when they've done brain scans on children, not only or not on children and adults who've experienced childhood trauma, it's underdeveloped and there's less synaptic connections. Now, our prefrontal cortex is like our executive functioning and helps us with planning, making decisions, and helps to control impulses. So if that's underdeveloped, it really works against the, imp the increased impulsivity and it's just a, a bad, bad combination of trying to make good choices. And I think, you know, we can think about this and people might make bad decisions and choose not to eat healthy or eat, take illicit drugs, etc. But sometimes, just to put it in perspective, I think as a parent, I don't know if anyone else has kids, I've got three little people at home. And when I think about my parenting skills and on really bad days and I'm really stressed out, my, if I've got poor planning, like I haven't made their lunches on time or something, um, if I've got bad decision making, which can happen, you know, I've given like candy before bed or something, um, and poor impulse control, like you blow up in anger because of something they've done, you don't feel like a very good parent. And these are just, for most of us, just one-offs. But I think it's important for us to think about how toxic stress can affect the brain and how this can affect parenting. Because I think when working in primary care and working with families, I think this is really important to think about beyond just healthy health risk factors and health risk decisions. Toxic stress also affects our health, not just in the forms of the brain, but in hormones. And we all know that stress affects our hormones are affected by stress. But the difference with toxic stress is it's a sustained stress response. Our bodies are made to deal with stress, but it's the sustained stress that is difficult for our bodies to deal with. So we're, we're stressed out, we go into fight or flight. So sympathetic nervous system comes into play. Also HPA axis, so hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal gland. 
axis work together. So that's the way our bodies are made to deal with stress. The problem is, is this is sustained. This is going over and over and over. So it's not about a child who is dealing with a, something stressful, like a scary animal. It's that something scary is in their house, and they're dealing with this over and over and over and over and over. So the cortisol that's supposed to be released actually keeps getting released. And the negative feedback loop that's made to kind of curb the hormones and bring them back to normal levels is disrupted. So this actually affects us in two ways, with high and low cortisol. So in certain areas, there'll be low cortisol. Low cortisol is linked to having increased inflammation. In other areas, we'll have high cortisol. And high cortisol is related to having a suppressed immune system. So if you think about looking at people, caring for people in primary care, the worst case scenario, you could have someone with a weakened immune system and increased inflammation, which is a recipe for disaster as far as health. I mean, every system in our body is affected by inflammation and obviously we need our immune system to be healthy. There's a lot of other hormones involved with our stress response, but cortisol seems to be the main one, and this was what I focused on. I don't want to spend too long on, on um, endocrinology. It gets even deeper than hormones, too. So there's changes to the brain, there's changes to our hormones and, and um, our cortisol levels, but it gets deeper than that. So the epigenetics and telomere length. So the science behind this stuff is really just still coming out. This is, I found, very exciting. Um, so toxic stress alters the gene expression from changes to DNA and RNA. So even the way that DNA is transcribed and the methylation on the DNA and RNA is altered from toxic stress. Toxic stress also shortens our leukocyte telomere length. So that little picture of the chromosome, those little green tips are the telomeres. And the best analogy I've heard, they're like the little plastic tips of your shoelaces and they get frayed over time. And over time, if they get shortened from stress, it actually accelerates cell aging and it can increase health risks. So things like inflammation again and more risks of cancer and many other health issues have been linked to telomere length. And in fact, as a researcher in Australia, um, a woman from Melbourne who's won a Nobel Prize for her studies in telomere length, so it's fascinating. And obviously these are inherited. So our DNA and RNA is inherited, telomere length is inherited. So thinking about toxic stress and childhood trauma, and if we think about intergenerational trauma, it is so much more than the social determinants of health or parenting or experiences your parents have been through. There's actually inherited causes that babies can even be born with that they may be more likely to deal with other he more health risks. So what does all this mean for primary care? So a lar large part of my practicum project was to get as much ACEs literature as I could to distill it, to try to sell it to the staff at Inala, and why it's going to be important, why should we screen for ACEs. And also part of it was trying to see where has it worked, so are there any <coughs> primary care centers that have successfully screened, and what were some of the challenges they faced. So at Inala Primary Care, we decided we're going to screen all adults. We're going to make a universal screening for every patient 18 to 55. So once we explained the toxic stress and how ACEs affects health outcomes, and really all the, big, all the science behind it, most GPs were on board and they figured, hey, why don't we just get an ACEs score? I mean, if we are going to send an adult for, let's say, standard bowel cancer screening at 50, maybe if we know that they have a high ACE score, maybe we'll send them at 45 <coughs> years older or 35 years old. If we know that they're more at risk, it can change our practice of how we might go about planning their long-term care plan. Anonymous scoring, now this came up as a really popular option when we discussed ACEs at the primary care center. Because there's a way you can score without having to actually mark off which types of adversity you experienced. You can really just do a tally on the side and we can help the patient through that and there's a tally score on a separate sheet. So all the, the doctor or nurse will get is a number. They don't need to know what types of adversity, they really just need to know the number because all the science is showing you the number matters not what types of adversity you face, it's how much. And so there's resistance to screening, obviously. Um, many of us are busy. I know that when I'm at triage and we have a lineup and someone hands me a new screening tool for infection control or something, I'm not that keen on taking time out of a busy triage five minute process to do an extra screening tool. So that's a big barrier and a resistance from most staff is we don't have time for this. And I, from what's in all our primary care, from what I've seen, they're very busy. And um, that was an issue that we had to discuss. Um, so uh, some of the research that's come out of successful clinics that have done this is in five minutes they were able to do an A screen and 90% of the people who, 90% of the A scores that they take took less than five minutes. 
So if five minutes can be allocated, I think it's worth the time, considering the long-term health risk. The next topic that was an issue for people was sensitivity. Why do I want to ask people about such sensitive topics? They've come in for us for like an ear infection. Why am I going to bring up childhood abuse? So obviously that's a topic that we had to discuss because those are common barriers. Um, first of all, the anonymous screening cuts that out really easily. And um, I, think, I think we need to think about as healthcare professionals, if people, if we can't talk about childhood trauma, I don't know who else can with patients. Um, thank you. So I think it's important to realize that we're very trusted by the public. And it's before we do ACEs screening, it's prefaced by an introductory letter and information to so they understand why we're doing it, why it's important, and it's completely confidential. And it's also not obligatory. People can choose not to do it. So I think there are ways around it. And I think dealing with talking about toxic stress, part of the problem is stigma that's around abuse and, and trauma. And I think the more that we're able to talk to patients about it, the better. So next, pediatrics, obviously, um, we wanted to screen children, but that posed an issue for duty to report, at least in all of primary care, and we didn't want to go down that road just yet. But we do have um, people very interested at Children's Health Queensland who would like to get on board with ACEs screening, and as my background is pediatrics, I'm very interested to see where we can go, and there are some clinics in the States that are very successful doing child ACE screening. Next is create a toolkit. So a toolkit, basically, how can a primary care center be its best to be ACEs informed, trauma informed, similar, but also being informed if they're going to be doing screening for ACEs. Positive relationships is the number one thing that can help children and adults deal with any adversity they've been through. So SSNRs, I wrote up there, is for safe, stable, nurturing relationships. This is the most important factor to buffer adversity. And so parenting support programs, m helping with mother-child groups, um, issues to help with intimate partner violence support, so that's something that I think can be worked on. Home visiting. I know this has been around for a long time, but I kind of feel like it's going down in my generation. And I, there, it, research is showing how important home visiting is. So I know this is something that primary care can do well. And the research shows it, it does do a big, big, big thing for families, especially women, pregnant women and parents with small children. Team-based primary care. I've seen that's a big topic this weekend at the conference on the medical home models and um, or the medical home and multidisciplinary teams is obviously best practice. Um, helping families deal with mental health issues and also a toolkit that helps with sleep, nutrition, physical fitness, and mindfulness. And finally, the biggest thing with ACEs is resilience. It's recognizing resilience and building on resilience because it is the buffer and it's the resilience is the one thing that can counter with adversity. So helping families recognize the resilience they already have, how far they've come, and how they're still doing a great job with their kids. So it really is about treating the family and I think treating them in a team. So that's where we're at. This is my last slide. So thank you for having me in primary care. <laughs>